Hello, my name is Raymond Hughes, and I am the interviewer for the Veterans History Project, a part of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and also uh, affiliated with the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library, located here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today's date is the second day of June, 2015. And today we have the privilege and honor to interview James G. Powell, a resident of Cincinnati, Ohio, and a veteran of the United States Air Force. And uh, do you mind if I call you Jim, or would you prefer James? Jim is fine, that's what Jim. everyone calls me. Um, Jim, if you would, uh, we'd like to start with uh, some genealogical and biographical information first. Uh, before we get into your military service. Okay. Um, if you would tell us uh, when you were born and where and uh, who your parents were and uh, some background information if you would. Okay. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, July 19, 1944. Okay. My parents were Arnell and Gladys Powell who were originally out of Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My folks lived in Omaha, Nebraska for a short period of time, and then we left Omaha, Nebraska, and moved to Topeka, Kansas. We lived in Topeka, Kansas from the time I was probably about five until I was about 15 or something like that. In the interim, my folks had gone to Oakland, California, lived there for about a year, come back to Kansas. Okay? Grandfather was ill, not expected to live, but that's what brought him back to uh, Kansas at the time. Uh, I grew up there in Topeka. Uh, and there are different things that happened while I was there. Historically, one of the things that happened that you're familiar with was when we got into the Brown versus uh, the Peak Board of Education that ended up integrating all of the schools. You know? And of course, I knew Linda Brown at that time. I knew who she was at least. She was a little older than I was, but I knew who she was. And basically what that did was, and a lot of people may or may not know this, but it opened up the schools across the country. And when it opened up the schools across the country, it also opened up a lot of other things. For example, uh, my uh, best buddy, a uh, guy named Joseph Anderson, had a father who ran the films for us. And there was one theater that we could go to at the time called the Ritz Theater. It cost 14 cents to get in, okay? And there was the Grand, the Dickinson, the Jayhawk, none of which we could go to. But when they integrated the schools, that also opened up those theaters. In addition to that, there was one swimming pool that we could attend, which was called City Park, you know. And I say we, it means other black kids and all the African Americans, which is common today, are popular today. We were only allowed to go to that particular pool. But again, once Brown versus the Board of Peak of Education came about, and the results of that, we now could go to the big swimming pool, which was Gage Park. You know? So a lot of different things opened up as a result of that. You know? okay. That's, uh that case was decided in 1954, if I That's remember. That's correct. That yeah. is correct and all. And, and I really didn't know much of a difference except for the fact that, and, and I would not have known this at the time, but my mom was talking to someone on the phone one day and she indicated that we went from about 32 or 33 students per class down to about 16 or 17 students per class. Well, once that happened, you got more attention from each teacher and my grades started to rise. Okay. So I benefited in more than one way. So uh, in 1954, you were in what grade of school? Uh, let's see, I would have been about 10 years old, so that would have put me about the, about the fourth grade. Okay, and, uh, and the lady's name was? Uh, Linda Brown. Linda Brown. Yeah, Linda Brown, uh, Brown versus Pika Board of Education. Now did you, uh, did she live in your neighborhood or did she, she just did go not. to? She did not, she lived in another part of town and I knew who she was, and the main reason I who, knew who she was because my buddy Joe, who was only about a year and a half older than I chronologically, and three or four years older emotionally, mm -hmm. okay, met her a couple of times at the movie theater, and I was with him when he met her. Okay, oh, that's I, why I knew who Linda Brown was. I, I see, I see. Now. Um, you mentioned your mother and father. Uh, what did your father do for a living, uh, Jim? Dad worked at that time at Santa Fe Railroad Shops, and he was a welder, okay? He worked there until he was laid off, and I don't remember exactly what happened, but they were cutting back as they do today from time to time. 
When he left that job, he went to a job working as a nurse's aide at the Veterans Hospital. He then worked as a nurse's aide for the next 30 years. Okay. Veterans Hospital where? Topeka, Kansas, and then on to Denver, Colorado, because my folks moved to Denver later on. Uh, there was a, uh, an influx of people migrating, so to speak, from Topeka to Denver. And the reason was because of the fact that Denver was more liberal, it was more open, and if you had the money, you could buy a home anywhere. So for a lot of blacks, they felt there was better opportunity for their kids and that sort of thing. And all. So dad worked at the VA hospital there in Topeka, then he transferred to Denver, Colorado, where he worked for the next 20 some odd years. Now, were you with him when he transferred to Denver? Yes, I was. Okay. The whole family went. And okay. when I say the whole family, I'm an only child. So the three of us moved, okay? okay. Yeah. You weren't spoiled or anything, were you? You know what? My folks were bound and determined I was not going to be spoiled, okay? I had buddies who had three or four sisters and they had more than I had. My mom had me washing dishes from the time I was five. By the time I was eight, not only was I washing dishes, but I was helping with the cooking, helping clean the house, sometimes turning the laundry out by myself, cutting the yard, helping dad with his car as far as cleaning this, that, and the other and all. There was no such thing as spoiling James Powell. <laughs> you know, you've mentioned your mother now several times. Um, what was your mother's maiden name? Stuart. And her full name was? Gladys Amelia Stewart. I see. Okay. And where was she from? They were both from Omaha. I'm sorry. They were both from Oklahoma. Okay. They grew up in a little place called Lenapa, Oklahoma. Uh, Lenapa, Oklahoma is approximately 130 to 140 miles south of Topeka, Kansas. All right. Okay. Um, I, let me just, if I may diverge a minute. It's interesting, her name was Amelia. We all know about Amelia Earhart and the flying that she did and this thing mm -hmm. and the other. And, and we'll get to that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm gonna tell it some now so I don't forget about it. Mom talks about a situation where she and a bunch of kids went to the airport. And when they got to the airport, there was an individual that was taking kids up for about 10, 15 minutes, as long as they had their quarters. And she had a quarter. And she stepped up, presented her quarter, but because of her ethnicity at the time, the fellow refused to take her flying. Years later, and like I said, we'll get to that, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about it now. Uh -huh. Years later and all, when I got her that same thing while I was actually flying an airplane and all, I remember her saying something to one of her friends on the phone and said, when I think back to years ago when that individual would not take me flying and now my son is flying an airplane that's bigger than something he ever even thought of and all, because one of the wheels on the airplane I flew probably weighed as much as his whole airplane. Right. Okay? But anyway, uh, getting back to your point, it was uh, Lenapa, Oklahoma, probably had a total of maybe 150 people in it, very small town, very rural. Um, did your mother work or was she? Yes, uh, in fact, I say jokingly, uh, I had several buddies, uh, Bernard, Walter, and James, they're our minister's three sons, their mother worked. Joe, whom I've mentioned to you, his mother worked. Roscoe, his mother worked. And there's several other friends I had, and all the mothers worked, and there's a very good reason for that. If you go back to the time when we grew up, the social setting was such that our fathers, in many cases, didn't make enough money. Mm. When mom and dad bought their first house, I was eight years of age. Dad was making $150 a month, and mom was making $190 a month, okay? So all of us had working mothers. You know, some years later when the, uh, when the, uh, the women's movement came about, I have said from time to time, most black women were not a part of that. And the reason being, Caucasian women were trying to figure out a way to go to work. Black women were trying to figure out a way to go home, mm -hmm. okay? Because our fathers didn't make enough money, therefore both had to work and all. So yeah, mom did work. She worked at the uh, state hospital uh, she had two years of college uh, from the 40s. She had been a, a teacher for a short period of time because there was a time with two years of college you could teach, yes. okay? Uh, nowadays, you've got to have four years, you've got to have the teacher certificate and all of that. Money. Before that, she could teach at that time and she did teach for a couple of years. But when she moved to Kansas, for whatever reason, she could no longer get into that capacity. So that's what she did. There were also times when she worked in people's homes cleaning. Mm -hmm. And 
I got what you might call the benefit of that. And the reason I say you might call the benefit of that is because mom would come into my room and if the book was out of place, my room needed cleaning as far as she was concerned. Mm -hmm. And her theory, she had two theories. The first theory was I am not going to go and clean other people's house and then come home to a dirty house. Okay? So I had to work to keep my area clean, regardless okay. of whether I wanted okay. to or not. And then in addition to that, again, if you look at the social setting at the time, many times blacks could not stay in motels, hotels, and that sort right. of thing. So her feeling was, you never know when somebody's going to come through and need a place to stay. So whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, when you don't have time to get it ready, if it's ready all the time, you're set. Right. So you could have walked in our house at any time. It was like opening up a magazine. Everything was in place. I see. Now, uh, where did you go to high school then, Jim? I went to high school at East Denver High. Um, I was there in the early 60s. When I started school there, we had 3,158 students. Probably about 20 or 30 of us were black. Okay? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons was because there's certain people that were moving into certain areas and suddenly they could get into the school and they couldn't attend before, and now they could attend that school. Okay? Never a racial issue or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it was a good school, and it was ranked at one time number one high school in the country. What was the name of it again? East Denver High School. Mm -hmm. okay. And I had to stop and think about that because when I was living in Topeka, the junior high school that I would have gone to was East Topeka Junior High. Okay. okay. And uh, I'm going to tell you something that you didn't ask me about and all of it is kind of interesting. When I see my friends, I ask them, do you remember the school model? And no one remembers it but yours truly. Okay. But it went something like, uh, pledge myself faithful with heart and with hand to the flag of East Topeka and alone may it stand to be honest, loyal, trustworthy too, to the flag of East Topeka all will ever be true. Okay. And like I said, I still remember that 50 years later. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most of my friends have forgotten it. When I got to East Denver, they didn't have a school slogan, so I don't have that one memorized and no. all. But it was a good school. Uh, the school that I would have gone to in Topeka, Topeka High School, one year, East High was the number one school there in Denver. The next year, or the year before, I forgot which, Topeka High was the number one school. It's just okay. interesting that those coincidences yeah. were there. And supposedly, the same architect designed both schools. Oh, is that right? Yes. The, um, so what, what year did you graduate from high school? Ooh, tell my age here, 1962. 1962? Right. Now, were you uh, in athletics or uh, in high school? I was in the athletics in junior high school, and I had the athletic ability, but I did not participate in, in athletics in high school. And the reason was because <clears throat> I was a very independent kid. Okay? Uh, there was an occasion in junior high when I'd asked my dad for a dollar, and he had said to me, every time you look around, you got your hand out. I made it a point of never asking for another dollar again. Okay? And when I was in high school in Denver, I worked before or after school and sometimes both so that I had my own money to take the little girls out and didn't have to ask mom and dad for money. So in retrospect, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. I came out of high school standing at six, three and a half, weighing 215 pounds, wearing a 46 coat and a 33 belt. Okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean much today because kids are so much bigger. But in those right. days, that was that big. Was, yeah. And I had speed and I had ability and agility and this, that, and the other and all. But I did, not, I did not participate in sports because of that. I chose the work. <laughs> did you go to college right after high school then? I did. Um, I, I'm going to say something generic and I won't, I won't belabor this and all. But I made the mistake of getting married very early. And when I say very early, I got married at 17 the first time and divorced at 19. I see. Right? And as I've told several people before, I was dumb enough to get married but smart enough to stay in school. Okay? Okay. So I started college right after high school, and I started University of Colorado Extension Center, okay? And I was there for actually about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. no, I couldn't go full time because I was working and paying bills and that sort of thing. So I would go part time, uh, six hours this semester, nine hours the next semester, two hours in this course this summer, followed by another two hours the next course that summer, and then back that fall, mm -hmm. school year round. And I did that for about three and a half years. I see. Uh, incidentally, you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to mention it, because uh, I've got a grandson that just graduated from Purdue and all, and uh, I helped him pretty extensively with his tuition. 
Well, when I went to school, the University of Colorado Extension Center, <clears throat> the deal was if you took up to 10 hours, it cost you $110 for the semester tuition-wise. Anything above that was free. Oh, boy. Yeah. That wouldn't even pay for my grandson's books today. No, of course <laughs> not. No. So uh, did you graduate from college? I did, but I did not graduate from the University of Colorado. Uh, a young lady came along, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, I ended up getting married a second time. And when I got married, because her parents lived in Denver and my parents lived in Denver. Now, who was she? Ruth. Oh. Okay, that's my second wife, Ruth. Right. Okay. And Ruth's maiden name was? Oliver, okay. O-L-I-V-E-R. Okay. Ruth had already finished school and was teaching school in Dallas. I felt that because my parents lived in Denver and her parents lived in Denver, it's probably a pretty smart idea to go where we could be on our own and make our own decisions. So I followed her to Dallas and I started going to school down there. Okay. I, see. I went to a smaller school called Bishop College and I graduated in 69. 1969? 1969, that's correct. I see. Um, and when did you and Ruth get married? We got married Christmas Eve of 1966. I decided I was not going to be one of these husbands that was always in trouble because he couldn't remember the marital date. <laughs> okay, so we set it up for Christmas Eve. That, that was my doing. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, outstanding. Um, so you've graduated uh, in 1969 from Bishop College. You're That's married right. to Ruth. Mm -hmm. Do you have any children by then or not? Uh, we did not have any children at that time. Uh, my son would come along a couple of years later, okay, mm -hmm. but not at that time. I see. Um, well, I want to get to the birth of your, of your children, but uh, when you graduated from college at Bishop, mm -hmm. did you go into the military right away? Or, or this is 1969 now. That's correct. We're in the height of, uh, of Vietnam. Uh, is that when you joined the service, or when that, did you join? That is correct. That is correct. I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent here and talk about something you didn't ask about, but I think it's, it's, it's significant. Someone bring it up and all. Good. Uh, I met Ruth <clears throat> through my church. Uh, we both have always been musically oriented. Uh, my wife sang in the choir. She was a music major. No. And she belonged to a different church. But she was asked to help with the teenage choir for this particular occasion because the director at our church was going to take a teenage choir from Denver to Oklahoma City for a concert. She asked me if I would help out with the bassist and if my wife would help out with the sopranos. Okay. And I said, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And I noticed her uh, for several different reasons. Number one, she was attractive, she was outgoing, a lot of other positives and said the other, which made me feel good. Anyway, we went to Oklahoma City, we put on the concert, we came back to Denver, and she and I went out on a date. No, uh, we went to uh, the Drumstick, which was a restaurant that served chicken in those days. Mm -hmm. And then we went to see a movie, and she doesn't remember all this, but I remember trivia, just don't ask me anything important, okay? Uh, we went to see John Wayne in a movie called In Harm's Way, mm -hmm. okay? It was supposed to be a serious movie and we laughed all the way through it. There were things that we saw that were humorous to us that were not humorous to anybody else. We were only two laughing in the whole theater, okay? When we got back, <clears throat> she said to me, she said, uh, we were at her mother's house, she said, and she was home for the summer, by the way, because she was teaching school and she was off for the summer. She said, uh, what are you going to do when you finish college? And I said, I really don't know. I really don't know. I said, I kind of like airplanes. And she said to me, she said, well, don't they have a flying school out of Clinton Aviation? Why don't you go out there and check? Now, we've talked about this over the years. We don't know why she knew there was a Clinton Aviation. She had no interest in flying. She knew no one that was flying. Nobody had called her. But somehow or another, she knew there was a Clinton Aviation. So I said, well, OK, uh, I'll go check on that. And I was motivated already by this lady that was taking an interest in me. So the next weekend, I went out and I got what they call a dollar ride. 
Now back in the 40s, the dollar ride meant you paid a guy a dollar and he took you up <clears throat> and you were in there for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something other like that. Well, by the time I came along, that dollar ride was now $5. Today it's probably $50, okay? Mm -hmm. But the instructor found out later on, his name was Julius Corman. He was a retired lieutenant colonel from World War II and he had about 30,000 hours of flying time in heavy airplanes. We took off and he allowed me to take the airplane off the ground. Okay, and then once we got airborne, he said, okay, I've got the airplane. And he got up and did some turns right and left and let me do some turns right and left and the second other. And after about 30 minutes, we came down. I said, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to fly airplanes. So while I was working in, in Denver, I was also taking flying lessons, okay? Mm -hmm as well as going to college and all. And <clears throat> I often wonder if that would have happened had it not been my wife saying, well, doesn't Clinton, Clinton Aviation have yeah. a school out there? So I want to bring, bring that up because that's very sure. important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she, was, she was a catalyst that got all that started. Good, <laughs> good. Um, we got, uh, got married uh, on Christmas Eve of 66, as I said. When I finished uh, college, I was in pilot training about six to eight weeks later, okay? Um, you went down and joined? I did, okay. I did. Well, there's more to the story. Uh, and I told you I graduated in 69, which is accurate. In the fall of 68, I got a draft notice, okay? You know, one of these greetings, you know, right. report at this particular time. And I told my wife about it. First of all, I'm frustrated because I've been trying to get through school. It's taken longer than average. I couldn't do it in four years because I had to work and go to school part time. My wife's literally in tears. Says, it's not fair. You're about to graduate from school. It's not fair. I had no idea what to do. So I sat down. I wrote President Johnson. I said, I am told that I have until I am 33 to fulfill my commitment. Certainly you can wait another six months and let me finish college. Okay. And I said, I'm taking private license, lessons. And at this time, I had a private pilot's license, a commercial pilot's license, and an instrument pilot's license, because I'd been building these things up, hoping to eventually get on with an airline somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. And <clears throat> I fibbed a little bit, because I said, my intention is to go in and fly for the Marines. What have you? I really had no intention of flying for the Marines. But I felt like that might carry a little weight. Well, I don't know if it carried any weight or not. But sure enough, I got a letter back uh, about two weeks later, and I'm sure President Johnson never saw it. He's got other right. things to do, other important things. <laughs> I'm sure he never saw my letter. But it said, President Johnson thanks you for your letter dated such and such a date. This information has been forwarded on your Selective Service Board. The Selective Service Board sent me one more school deferment, and that was going to allow me to finish college. Ah, you know? okay. Okay. So uh, that's, that's kind of a long story to whether no. or not I went from college right into the Air Force. Well, that's that what happened. That explains it, yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, I left and I went, I finished up college. And I will tell you this, there, there's, there are sayings that you hear from time to time, but one of the sayings that you hear is, if you want to know something about a particular area, talk to somebody who's done it as opposed to someone who has not. If you want to know how to become wealthy, talk to someone who's wealthy. If you want to know how to become poor, talk to someone who's poor. poor. Okay, mm -hmm. same principle. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I talked to several people about going in the Air Force and flying airplanes. And I would get this, nobody's going to let you fly airplanes because of my color. Okay. So the people who said those things to me, I didn't talk to anymore. <laughs> I mm -hmm. found somebody else that would give me encouragement one way or another and all. And when I took the Air Force officer's qualifying test, I did not initially pass it, so I was told. I was told I passed the pilot's portion, but didn't pass the navigator's portion. I said, well, I want to be a pilot, so what's, what's the problem? I said, well, you got to pass both. I had a friend at the time, a Major Dwight Egan, Eaton, who had flown in World War II. He'd flown P-51s and a bunch of other airplanes, and he was always encouraging me. In fact, he'd gone up with me a couple of times and encouraged me on my flying. He said, Jim, let me do some check rounds so I can find out. Well, before that could happen, I called them again. They said, by the way, we made a mistake. You passed both. So then I went down and signed up to go in. Okay? I see. So that's how all that took place. I see. Um, so you joined in 1959. Where were, uh, where were you first sent? Joined in 1969. 
I mean, uh, yeah, excuse no me, 1969. And they sent me, you just trying to see if I'm awake, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they sent me to Columbus Air Force Base for, for undergraduate pilot training, which was 53 weeks at that time, okay. You had six months where you train in a Cessna 172, they call it a T-41. And then you had approximately five and a half months when you train in a T-37. And then the last six months you train in a T-38. Uh, you know what a T-41 is, that's a Cessna airplane, propeller driven and all. T-37 is an airplane that's made by Cessna with twin jets and all. <clears throat> and then the T-38 also has twin jets, but uh, it's a very fast trainer. Uh, it's a supersonic trainer, as a matter of fact, okay? Uh, for the first six weeks I was in pilot training, uh, I did very well. There were 75 in our class, I'm the only black and all, uh, which wasn't an issue one way or another, but I was certainly aware of it. Because right. when you're the only black or the only female or whatever it happens to be, when you're doing well, everyone knows it. When you're having your problems, everyone knows it right. also, okay? Um, when we finished, well, while I was in the T-41, I was doing pretty well because I already had some training and I knew I could fly airplanes. And a lot of times, the difference between the guy who does well and the guy who does not well, does not do well, is one guy knows he can fly and another one's not sure, okay? I knew I could fly and I did well uh, with my instructor. In fact, the first time we went up, I had been told before, don't let them know that you have flown airplanes. Just kind of keep quiet about that now. I think they figured you might get the big head or something. So my instructor had three different students at his table. I was one of the three and said, have you have flown? No. Have you flown? No. And he asked me, have I flown? And I'm thinking about this information I got, you know, this advice. I said, well, a little bit. He said, okay. Well, I was the first one he took up. And we get up there and he says, now I'm going to do a turn to the right. When he does a turn to the right, doesn't lose any altitude. He said, now I'm going to bring it back to the left. He does the same thing. He said, now why don't you try it? So I take the airplane. He says, let's go left. So we go left, haven't lost any altitude. Come back to the right, haven't lost any altitude. He said, how much training have you had? And then I hesitated. I wasn't sure what to say. I said, well, I've got a private pilot's license and a commercial pilot's license and an instrument pilot's license. He started laughing and said, we're going to have a ball, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I think what he recognized was he wasn't going to have to spend as much time with me as the other two guys, what have you. So things went well. Uh, I used to remember his name, it escapes me now and all. But uh, I did that training with him and it went well. And then one day I had a guest trainer. If you're doing well, they'd send you up with another instructor from time to time. Mm -hmm. This guy goes with me and we get up and we, he says, okay, I'd like you to do this and I did, I'd like you to do that and I did it. All the things he wanted me to do, I did. He said, well, we got some next time. You want to do anything else? I said, uh, you ever flown backwards? He said, I beg your pardon? I said, you ever flown backwards? He said, no. I said, watch this. So I pulled the power back, dropped the flaps, if you're at 60 miles per hour at a certain altitude and the wind's coming at you 70 miles per hour, you're actually moving backwards over the ground at 10 miles per hour. And that's what we're doing. He looked down there and said, wow, I've never done that before. <laughs> okay. And I was just fascinated with it. Well, anyway, that went well. Coming out of the, out of the 141, I'm sorry, out of the T-41, I was number two in my class. I came to pilot training with 240 hours, which I had built up saving and, and buying, you know, Coke bottles and everything else, mm -hmm. everything I could get my hands on to pay for flying time. There's a kid named Randy Faldi, and Randy came to pilot training with some 1,100 hours, okay, including some time in a T-33, which you probably remember from your mm -hmm. experience sure. and all. And uh, when we came out of uh, that first phase, that first six months, Randy was number one in class and I was number two in class, okay. And again, Randy was one of these down-to-earth guys. You'd never known he'd flown because no big head or anything like that. We went into T-37s, and I got a guy, and I won't mention his name, what have you, <laughs> but I remember he yelled and screamed at me from the second flight. Didn't yell and scream on the first flight, but from the second flight until just before the last flight. That was his way of teaching. Because his theory was, if I can put enough pressure on that student when I'm up there and he can perform, when I'm on the ground and something goes wrong with the airplane, he'll still be able to perform, okay? And, and it's probably just as well, because I had all sorts of things to go on my airplanes. You know, I, I, I lost steering on one once, uh, 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 nose wheel steering, uh, just for takeoff. Uh, I had a situation where 
uh, the flaps wouldn't come down for me. I had another situation where you have a stabilizer trim which makes the airplane go up and down and the hydraulics frozen on it and I'm flying it like so. Oh. A number of things, no. But since I didn't have that guy up there yelling and screaming at me, it made all the difference in the world, okay? Now, in the, in the 141, you're taught not to spin the airplane, okay? Because that can get you in trouble. Most people don't have the experience to know how to get out of it. So I've been taught never ever spin the airplane, never ever spin the airplane, never ever spin the airplane. The guy who was a captain at the time, and I'm a second lieutenant, says, Lieutenant Powell, today we're gonna spin the airplane. Mm. And I'm thinking, I've been taught never to spin the airplane, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? And we get in there, and he spins the airplane, and I'm getting sick, about to regurgitate. And I don't have a sick bag. But you always fly with gloves on in the military, okay? I'm sitting there thinking, oh boy, what do I do now? So I knew I was going to get sick, and there was a rule. And the rule was if you get sick, you clean up the airplane. Okay. I was not going to clean up the airplane. <laughs> I took my glove off. I regurgitated into it, roped it off with a band, rubber band, put it down and said, okay, let's go. Didn't get sick anymore. <laughs> okay. We, um, we, uh, when I finished up uh, that phase, I was still running about number two in my class. The difference between number one and number five was about a fraction of a point, somewhere about there. Okay. And uh, most of my check rides were like 92, 93, 94, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I was fortunate that my check rides were that high because my academics were not as high. Uh, academically, I had an average of about 88, where well, the class average was 93. But my flying was high enough that when you put the two of them together, it still kept me about number two in the class. Right. Okay. We came out of uh, T-37s and uh, we went into T-38s. And the guy that yelled and screamed, if I don't forget about it, I'll tell you something when, when it's all over about him. We went into the T-38 and all, and that was okay. It went fairly well, and this, that, and that. Now, mind you, I'd always had 92, 93, 94 on my check rides and all. Well, they had what they call a final contact check ride, and I won't go through elaborating all the things that you did, but that was a very major check ride. Mm -hmm. It determined whether you're gonna be here or here in your class, okay? We took that one, and for the first time since I'd been in pilot training, I had a day when I couldn't do anything right, okay? Every, I had problems talking on the radio, I had problems finding the area. I did just enough right to pass the check ride. Passing was 70, I turned into 73, okay? Uh -huh. And <clears throat> really feeling badly about this, the flight training officer says to me, he says, uh, Lieutenant Powell, I want to see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Yes, sir, I'll be there. Well, I got there early, what have you. And at this time, my dauber's really down. And what I really need is somebody to pump me up. And I thought that's what he was going to do. And I get in there, and he starts telling me, do you know you've gone from almost the top of the class to almost the bottom of the class? And it went that way for the next six, seven, or eight minutes and all. And now I'm getting angry, you know. But I'm not about to say anything. He's a major, and I'm a lieutenant, right. you know. There's nothing wrong with my common sense, all right? So anyway, <clears throat> when he finally finishes, I'm headed home and I'm getting angrier and angrier. Now there's something that they have called SIA, which means self-initiated elimination. That's where you simply go and sign on the paper that you quit. Okay. And I said to myself, they can graduate me because I'm qualified, or they can kick me out because I'm not. I'll be doggone it, I'll quit. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's just the way I felt at the time. And I'm headed home, and I'm thinking about that, and I got home, I told my wife the same thing. Well, the next day, we were up for a four-ship ride. Now, on a four-ship, you have four airplanes up there. You're flying along at 400 miles per hour or faster. You've got three feet between your wingtip and the next guy's wingtip, okay? I'm flying with a guy that's number one in the class, number two in the class, and the other guy was somewhere in the top ten. I've gotten where now. <clears throat> when we all finish, I got the only excellent that day. You can get an excellent, you can get an excellent, a satisfactory, uh, unsatisfactory, and there's something else. I've forgotten what it was now. But I got the only excellent. So, mm -hmm. Well, not bad. Well, I went up two days later on another four ship, and again, I'm flying with guys who are in the upper portion of the class. And again, I got the only excellent. I said, shoot, I just had a bad day, okay? And I was no longer concerned about it and all. From then on, everything else went pretty well. Uh, I finished, 
Uh, unfortunately, I've made that drop, and there's no way I was going to get all that back. <laughs> you can't do that because this is close to the end of the session. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got about 50 weeks in. It's a 53-week school. It's just about over. Okay, but when I graduated, the thing that I really felt good about was I had earned those wings because I felt like they'd taken two years of college and shoved them into one. Right. Okay, uh, and winning those wings was extreme, extremely important to me. My father flew down from. Uh, See, he was living in Denver at the time, and he was extremely. My dad was not a man to say a whole lot. He's not one of these individuals to gush all over you and tell you how proud he was, and that's something, but you could see it in his face, you know. And uh, anyway, he came down, and he was there for the graduation. My wife pinned on the wings, and I feel like that was really an accomplishment and all. Oh, sure. You got to understand, at that time, you're there. I was there for 53 weeks. A week until a month after I came in, another black youngster came in and he washed out of the program. A week, a block, I'm sorry, a month before I left, another black kid came in. He was there when I left. So what I'm saying to you is, out of some 500 students, I'm the only black kid for almost a full year. And again, like I said a while ago, when you're doing well, everyone knows it. When you're not doing well, everyone knows right, it also. You know, you go to comments and you're, hi, Jim. Hi, how are you? You go to movie theater, hi, Jim. Hi, how are you? You go to chapel, hi. I don't have any idea who these people are, but they know who I am, okay? Yeah. And that kind of adds to the pressure and what have you, okay? So I really felt extremely good when that was all over, okay? I'll get into the next airplane when one of your further questions, what have yeah. you, unless uh, you want to hear it now. No, no. Uh, so you, uh, you finished the 53-week course, mm -hmm. and uh, you're still a second lieutenant? That's correct. And uh, so what, what happens next in your military? Well, the next thing that happens is you go to the airplane you're going to specialize in, okay? At the first level, everyone flies a T-41, everyone flies a T-37, everyone flies a T-38. Now, they've changed that now. It's different now. But in those days, that's where it was set up. The next airplane I was going to fly was a V-52, okay? Is that right? Yeah, heavy airplane. And <clears throat> the first thing they did was they had us to go through... Uh, Carswell Air Force Base, and we got what they call nuclear weapons training. And that's just to give us an idea about how they worked and how they didn't work and what you needed and didn't need. That sort of thing. But it took about a week to take that course. And I, I drove down there with a guy uh, named Mark. And I'm not, I'm not going to mention his last name. He may sue me for what I'm about to say at all, okay? Mark had been an engineering major. And Mark had just told me, well, if you didn't major in engineering, you wasted your time. And I was a sociology major, okay? Now, I'll tell you why that's significant pretty soon, though. But anyway, we go down there, and we're debating all sorts of things, what have you, and this, that, and that, and not agreeing on hardly anything. We're civil, but we're not agreeing on hardly anything. We're driving all the way from Michigan to Texas, okay? Disagreeing all the way. Anyway, we go through this course, we finish it, and then about three weeks later, something other like that, we're at Castle Air Force Base, training in the B-52, all right? When we had our check ride, we had the check ride together, we were kind of fortunate because once more we had an instructor and three other students. One of the students became a conscientious objector, so, cause, so he dropped out. He didn't want to fly an airplane that dropped bombs. And all. I'm uh, not sure why he joined, joined the military, right. but, but he didn't want to do that. So he dropped out. So it's just this one instructor and the two of us, which means he could spend a lot of time with us. Now you will recall that I said to you that my T-37 instructor was a screamer. Right. Scream from the second flight to the, just before the last flight. We get here and we got this major, Major Wampler, i never forget him, red-headed major, and he fit the Irish stereotype. Yelled and screamed and yelled and screamed. <laughs> okay, I'm mm -hmm. thinking, am I ever going to get away from this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, <clears throat> I, I, and I, I tried to talk to him, John, I said, you know, sir, and this was one day after we'd been flying with him for about three, four weeks. I said, you know, sir, when you yell and scream, what have you, it really distracts me, you know. And I was trying to be diplomatic, because after all, he's a major, I'm a lieutenant. Okay? Right. It, 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 it really distracts me. And uh, he said, well, I'll, I'll try and do better. <laughs> the next day, he's yelling and screaming just like he had all along. Yeah. What have you, okay. But when it came time for the check ride, we went up with this lieutenant colonel, and I got in the uh, seat first, and all. 
there are certain things that you do, and I won't go through that and what have you, it's not really germane, but what you do in the, in the, in the uh, traffic pattern when you get back is very important, you know. And <clears throat> I'm in the seat, and I'm really having a good day. When you fly a B-52, if you can keep it within three or four knots and within two or three degrees uh, heading-wise and what have you, you're doing real well. Right. And if you can keep within about 10 feet, you're doing real well also. Because the thing about flying an airplane is you're always correcting for heading, airspeed, and altitude, okay? That day, my, I don't think my altitude varied more than about five feet up or down. Uh, my heading was always within about one or two degrees, and my airspeed was always within a couple of knots or so. I, I'd had a good day, and I knew it. And, all. Mm -hmm. and we came around, we landed the first time. I had this nice, soft landing, but it wasn't quite what I wanted because we touched down, it rose a little bit, and then we talked to touch down again. So we're taking off. <clears throat> Instructor's in the right seat and says, well, Lieutenant, you want to get out and uh, rest on your laurels, or you want to try it again? And by this time, I'm, arrogance is not the word I want to use, okay? Mm -hmm. But my confidence is sky high. I said, I want to do it better. So I could have gotten out right then and there, it would have been fine. So we take it around, we come back around again. Again, I'm flying everything exactly where it needs to be in the same that the parameters are real tight and I'm following all of them. And had a nice soft landing, what have you. And then I got out, another guy got in, but I had set the bar. Okay? Right. Well, he has his check ride, does pretty well, things go pretty well and all. At the end of the course, <clears throat> the instructor, we about, got about 22 or 23 co-pilots there. The instructor says, um, we have a distinguished graduate, okay? And the distinguished graduate was Mark, uh, the engineer, you know, the one that told me I had wasted my time, you know, because I majored in sociology. He said, by the way, that's going to be shared by another pilot here, and that's James Powell, Lieutenant James Powell, the one who wasted his time in sociology. You have no idea how good I felt, <laughs> none whatsoever at all, because here was a guy that had told me that I'd wasted my time, what have you, and we'd both come out um, at the top of the class and all, so that went well. So Anyway, that's how my training went. Then when I got to my other base, we got into H models, what have you, and we spent a lot of time again training. The H model's a little different from the F model because of different systems, systems and this and the other. So you're still in training now? Well, you know what? The thing about the military is you're always in training. Right. Now, I had trained at Castle, and that was the basic that I needed to have for that particular airplane. Right. It could have been F-4s somewhere else, or F-106s, or, or T-830s, anything. But there was a basic amount of training that you needed to have, and I had that at that particular point. So when I got back to my base, now I'm training in the H model. But most of the extremely hard training is out of the way. Now we're just kind of getting used to the differences between the handling of this airplane and the handling of the other airplane. But okay. you're staying in, in bombers and, yes. and uh, heavy That's correct. Heavy bombers. That's correct. I ended up with four different types of bombers in my career. I trained in F models. I flew H models out of Wordsmith, Michigan. I flew D models in the Vietnam situation, and then toward the end of my career, I flew G models. Okay. okay. All B-52s. All B-52s. Right. right. So, where are you now? You've uh, you finished at California, and then you went to the H models, mm -hmm. and where are you at now physically? Okay, I'm physically at Fort Smith Air Force Base, Michigan. Okay. The Vietnam War is and going on. And this is what year would you say? Uh, that's approximately 1971. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I finished up in the spring of 71, so I'm there in 71. And uh, they're, they have what they call arc-like missions. And arc-like missions are where you have individual crews that are going over to Guam or Utapau, Thailand to fly in the bombing campaigns that are taking place in Vietnam, mm -hmm. all right? I'm at an H model base and the neat thing about being an H model base is crews would go for six months, I'm sorry, the, yeah, we'd go for six months, and then they may not go for another year, or a year and a half, something like that, okay? So anyway, <clears throat> my time to go to fly and that campaign came up, and someone came, comes up and says, hey Jim, I wanna go do some shopping. Can I take your place? And what he was talking about was, you could go to the BX 
and you could buy, as I did, two thousand dollars worth of stereo gear for about eight hundred bucks. Right. Okay. Or you could buy a ring, say for four or five hundred dollars, uh, in the states that sold for a hundred dollars over there. So that's what he meant when he said he wanted to do some shopping. You know, I said, you got it, because that meant I didn't have to separate from a family that didn't have to. Now I was willing to go if they wanted me to go, but if I had a choice, I was going to use the choice. I said, hey. I had a three-year-old kid, one of you, and the second mm -hmm. other, and I said, this is fine, take it. So he took it, he went merrily along his way. Well, the next time my turn came up, another co-pilot approached and said, hey, Jim, I'd like to take your place. You got it, <laughs> okay, go. The third time it happened, I kept looking for somebody to show up, and nobody showed up, so I <laughs> ended up going. <laughs> All right, so you, where did you go? Went to Utapai, Thailand. We started off, well, let me back that up. We started off in Guam. As a matter of fact, we started off in Guam That's and it. we had some real long missions. That's at Anderson Air Force Base? Anderson Air Force Base, yeah. that's correct. That's correct. Uh, our missions were actually about 12 to 13 hours long, about six hours to one, six and a half hours coming back, something like that. Where to missions. on your missions? So, uh, we were uh, dropping bombs in North Vietnam. From Anderson? From Anderson, that's correct, that's correct. Okay. And we did that, and I don't recall how many months, I'm gonna say for about four months, and then uh, we got sent, well, I think we did it for about three months, and we got sent to Utapau. And the nice thing about Utapau is the missions were much shorter, about a two and a half hour mission, you were done for the day, okay? Uh, and with me being tall and this, that, and the other, and all, sitting like so, for 13 hours was a little long. I mean, you could get out and go to the restroom, but the rest of the time you're still sitting there. No. And, and I've never had knee problems, this, that, and the other, but they almost felt like they were locking up on because you sat there for so long. Um, <clears throat> then we went to Utapau, as I said, and we had missions that we flew for about two and a half hours. We came back to Guam, and we were flying, and we were getting ready to come home. We'd been there for six months, okay? And remember what I said, there are, well, I didn't tell you this, but let me back up a minute. There were G-model crews and there were D-model crews, and they would go for six months, come home for 30 days, go for six months, come home for 30 days, go home for six months, come home for 30 days, with no end in sight. Mm -hmm. okay? And the only way you get out of that was a resigning commission. All right? We were an H-model crew, and at that time we still had uh, special weapons uh, as our designation. Okay? And because of that, we would be gone six months and then come home for X amount of time, and then maybe go back another six months, but we were home for a year, year and a half, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I came into the trailer one day, and at that time they had us all in the same trailer. You had a pilot, co-pilot, radar navigator, navigator, electronic warfare officer, all officers, and then you have an enlisted man who was a gunner, okay? And I noticed when I walked up to the trailer that there's a lot of cursing and swearing and, and yelling going on. And I walked through the door and said, what's the problem? I'm still a co-pilot at the time. We're coming back to this blankety, blankety, blank, blank, blank place. They had just found out that <clears throat> we were gonna go home and gonna be the first H model crew to have to come back okay. 30 days later. <laughs> 30 days later. 30 days later, no. So I sit down and grab a magazine and someone says, well, why aren't you upset? Everybody else is. I said, well, you know that $2,500 per diem that they gave us? I said, I haven't spent any of that. So I'm gonna bring my wife a little one back over here. And then they got to think about it. Oh, four of us ended up doing that, okay? We knew we were going back to Thailand. Right. We knew we were going to Utapau, okay? And they had what I would call an Americanized bungalow there because they had air conditioning, it was neat, it was clean, and that sort of thing. And the families were secure. All. Okay. And after I said I was going to do that, four of us ended up doing that same thing. So that worked out better after. What rank are you at this time? At that time, oh, at that time I was a captain. Okay, so you're very junior captain. Are you go, you're going to do a second tour in Vietnam now? Is that what you're saying? Uh, a second tour flying. That's correct. Because we we'd been there for six months. We went home for thirty days, and then we came back and did another three months. Okay. okay? And we were there at the right time, so to speak, because 
and I, want, I don't want to get this confused, but I believe this was about the time that Henry Kissinger had secured the signing of the treaties and all between us and the VC and North Vietnamese and whoever else was involved, if I remember correctly. And we still bombed until about the middle of the summer, despite the fact that all of that was signed, because I guess there were other uh, negotiations that had to be ferreted out with mm -hmm. others before we could stop. But what type of weapons are you dropping? What type of munitions are you dropping? Uh, conventionals, and by conventionals, uh, I mean dynamite type uh, bombs. Uh, 500 pounders, 1,000 pounders, that sort of thing. I think we even had 750 pounders also, okay. Big, big, big airplanes with did, big bombs. Did you drop any, uh, like, napalm type uh, weapons? No, uh, that's another fighter and another mission, and what have you. For ours, it was just the real heavies. But I, I had a friend, and at some point I'm, I may, we may talk about him and all, but my buddy Joe I was a West Point grad, he was an Army trooper. And when he found out that I was gonna be flying B-52, he said, oh, you're one of those guys that at three o'clock in the morning when I'm sleeping, <laughs> I get a call saying, you gotta be 6,000 meters that way by such and such a time. And I ask, are you kidding me? And they say, nope, out. <laughs> okay, he was a ground pounder, mm -hmm. all right? And because of that, he was seeing the other side of this situation. Right. The, the bombing was very devastating uh, for, for ground troops who were on the ground, it really was. Um, when I went through OTS, uh, there was a point when we were simulating bombs being thrown, whether you're using quarter, quarter sticks or dynamite and all, and you'd be laying on the ground, and you may explode one of those things, say, I'm going to say 30 or 40 feet away from me, and you could feel the concussion. When I, if you can feel the concussion from that, just imagine what you feel from a thousand pound bomb, right. you know, if, if you're right. anywhere close at all. And he said there are times when the ground would just tremble, you know, when the airplanes were dropping them. The, the 52s were nicknamed Silent Death right. because they flew so high you couldn't hear them. And a lot of times enemy soldiers would be walking around, all of a sudden the ground would just start trembling, what have you. And there are times when individuals were close to these concussions and they'd be bleeding from several orifices as a result of it. It's a very devastating weapon. Still is to this day. Yeah. Did, uh, did your plane get hit at any time that you were flying on these missions? It did not. It did not. And, and that didn't bother me. Right. Uh, of course all. not. <laughs> I, uh, I had a personal friend. Well, I had, I'll tell you two quick stories and all. There was a guy named uh, Dave McAvoy, neat, neat guy. He was my second uh, commander that I flew with, what have you. Uh, very easy going guy, and this and the other. In fact, Dave retired, I think it's a two-story general, if I remember correctly. But he had a situation where he's flying along with, uh, with a B-52. At that time, they were shooting a lot of surface-to-air missiles at them, right. okay? Those surface-to-air missiles about the length of a telephone pole with fire on the end. And if you shot one at 152, you had an electronic warfare officer who could tell you, pilot, break right or break left, and you did immediately what he told you to do. You could dodge one of those surface-to-air missiles, mm -hmm. okay, going right, going left, that sort of thing, no problem. What happened, if you and I stand 50 feet apart and throw rocks at each other, no problem, you know, I, I get out of the right. way, you got, neither one is gonna get hit. What the Vietnamese started to doing was salvoing bunches of them at the same time. Okay. okay. Now somebody's going to get hit. Well, you got this big airplane that, that's 158 feet long, and it's got a wingspan that's 185 feet on it, and this, that, and the other. You're going to get hit. So what guys started doing was rolling 90 degrees to make themselves a smaller silhouette. All right? right, right. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is if you do it too long, the airplane starts to lose altitude. And uh, Dave told me there was one situation where they lost about 10,000 feet as a result of that before they recovered. Right. <laughs> okay, there was another guy that went in like so, and he rolled so far over, he said, well, I might as well keep it going. So he completely rolled that airplane. And my understanding was that one sat on uh, Anderson Air Force Base and didn't fly after us because they didn't know what would happen to the wings. It wasn't built for that, okay, that sort of thing and all. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how that was being handled. But it was just a very interesting, interesting situation and all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now your wife and, um, and child or children? At that time, child. Are with you in 
Thailand? Yeah, I brought them back for a short period of time. Four people on our crew bought our wives, see, two, well, I was the only one that bought a child. And okay. is that your son? Your, that was my son. And your and son's name? Galen, G-A-L-E-N, okay. And uh, when was Galen born? Galen was born while I was in pilot training, believe it or not. Okay. In 1970. 1970. And uh, in fact, that was one of the things that, that they kind of wondered about, the, the strain of going through pilot training and all the studying and then having a child also, but that worked out okay, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, anyway, uh, I was the only one that had a child that came back. The other three just had their wives. And they came back for 30 days and they went back. They didn't stay for the entire time. Oh, okay. okay. All right. But, uh, it gave them a chance to see Bangkok, Thailand, and some other things, and another part of the world, and that's educational. You know. Certainly, yeah. Um, and do a lot of shopping and things of that nature. Uh, we did some shopping. Uh, I had a pair of shoes made, I still have them to this day, it cost me $10, okay. Mm -hmm. Good looking pair of shoes. <laughs> I'll bet. They, uh, they'd measure your foot and all, and measure your instep, and then they would make shoes for you, and I had one pair for thirteen dollars and one pair for ten. The pair for ten still looks good. The pair for thirteen I've owned since worn out and all. Clothing, I had a suit made for thirty-five dollars. I had a couple of sport jackets made. I think they cost me about twenty or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that was a good deal. Yeah. That was a good deal. So your wife goes back to Anderson, and she has uh, accommodations at Anderson for Galen and her. No, uh, they got on a plane, and. They flew into Bangkok, and then they got transportation to Utapau, okay? When they got ready to leave, they flew back into Bangkok, because that's where the airport was, mm -hmm. okay? Got on that and flew back to the United States. Oh, they went back home yeah. there. Oh, yeah, they, okay. so they were, only, they were only there for 30 days. And, it, and if I'd had any sense at all that, that there was any jeopardy, then I certainly would not have had them. No. <clears throat> um, so you did, for uh, if I'm correct, two tours for all intents and purposes in Vietnam. Back-to-back yeah, -back tours. Yeah. And at that time, you were a captain? That's correct. And you were a command pilot? No, I was co-pilot at the time. Co-pilot, right. okay. If I had, <laughs> you remember I told you about the two co-pilots came and said, hey, let me take your place? Yes. Had I gone in with my first crew, like the first guy went in, then I would have upgraded before that, okay. all right? But because I had put it off and all, there were others that were ahead of me to upgrade. Okay. So I didn't upgrade at that time. As a matter of fact, I see, we came out of uh, B-52 training in the spring of 71, and it was actually four years later when I upgraded. I upgraded in 75, all right? And the interesting about it is I upgraded <coughs> to aircraft commander, and then I got picked for security police, okay? <laughs> the, the Air Force, and I guess other branches also, from time to time will have a reduction in force. Yeah, riff. They were starting to do that and all. And because I had a sociology background, I was told that one of the reasons I was kept around is because they're going to put me in an area where I was working with people, <laughs> okay? Put me in security police and all. And I worked there on the ground in security police for two years. We're at? At Wordsmith, Michigan. Okay. Right, Wordsmith Air Force Base, Michigan. Right. That's about, uh, that's approximately 200 miles north of Detroit. Right. Okay, right off Lake Huron. And <clears throat> they told me, said, you'll be here in this career field for two years. Well, when my career was almost up, got a call from SAC. And SAC says, uh, you're not going back flying right now, you're going to Turkey. And my response was, where in the world is Turkey? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, you realize I'm supposed to go back to flying? He said, yep, we don't need you. You're going to Turkey. <laughs> All right. Well, there was an operation. I was working by this time as an operations officer, and that's second in charge. All right. They did send me to Turkey, sent me to a place called Injilik, Turkey. You know? mm -hmm. And I spent two years there at Injilik. Now, when I found out about this, I had some reservations because I didn't want to leave my family, you know, that it, if I could keep from it and all. I, you know, willing to go if I had to, but if I could avoid it, I was going to do that. And I was really thinking, I kind of want to fly airplanes, you know, and I kind of want to fly them for an airline. Now, you have to understand, 
The military only retains probably about 35% of the people who go in anyway. So I was just one of the 35 thinking, maybe I will get out. I'm sorry, one of the 65 thinking, right. maybe I'll get out. And I asked my wife, I said, uh, Angel, her name is Ruth, but I call her Angel, I said, Angel, what would you think about my getting out and taking my chances with airlines? To this day, she has not answered. <laughs> okay. Uh, she was going to leave that squarely on my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I'm not biting. <laughs> well, I, there was a guy, and I'll tell you, and this is kind of a selfish reason, but, but it's, it's, it's why I decided uh, not to do that. There was a guy named Harry Eidner, Sergeant Eidner. Uh, Sergeant Eidner is a Jewish fella you know, who had a wild sense of humor. Master Sergeant, just loved working with him and all. Um, I'd ask him, for example, say, Sergeant, are you serious about that? He'd say something like, Sir, I'm as serious as a sack of dead babies. Okay? And this was just the kind of sense of humor that this guy had and all. And one day he walked in, we had three flights. Two of the flights had black second lieutenants in charge. And then I'm black and I'm the operations officer, second in charge. And he says to me one day and says, you know, we got Sergeant Young, Sergeant, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Young and Lieutenant Marquis, both black in charge of two flights. We've got you and you're black and you're in charge, second in charge of the squadron. I said, Captain, this ain't the way my pappy said it was gonna be, you know. <laughs> And I'm sitting there rolling, what right. have you. But this is Sergeant Eidner and all. He's dead. He was joking, really. But this was his sense of humor. And I was talking to him about it. I said, you know, Sarge, I'm really thinking about getting out. You know, he said, well, why would you want to do that? We talked about it for a while, you know. I like sports cars. And he talked to me. He said, you know what? He said, you need to stay in. I said, why? He said, well, you work in another career field. You've demonstrated the ability to do something besides fly airplanes. You're going to get promoted and all. He said, you know those little things on four wheels that you like so well called Porsches and all? Now's your opportunity to get one. I said, oh, that is right. Okay. So I ended up staying in, all right? And I did get one of the Porsches while I was gone, <laughs> okay? All right, so, uh, but now we're only into, uh, what, the late 70s? Uh, I, was, I was upgraded to aircraft commander in 75. And 77, I was supposed to go back to flying, and that's when they told me, told me they were going to send me to Turkey. Turkey. So I'm in Turkey from 77 until 79. Okay. And you're a captain still? I'm still a captain. Coming out of, uh, out of that career field, I'm coming up for major. All right. What were you doing in Turkey? What was your job? Uh, as an operations officer in Security Peace Squadron, I was second in charge. We had three security flights and three law enforcement flights, okay? And as security flights, one of the things that you do is you protect the weapons in the weapons storage area, okay? Uh, in addition to that, you, because of law enforcement, there's certain little things that you take care of, speeding, uh, going through a stop sign. Simple things, nothing like civilian police do. Right. Nothing nearly as, as dramatic as what they do. But still, you need that enforcement. Right? Right. And that's basically what I was doing in security police. Okay. Uh, I'd been in security police there at Wordsmith, Michigan for two years, doing the same thing. And then I had gone to Injulik for another two years doing that same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I was doing at the time. Okay, so you're finished over there in what, in 1979? That's correct. You, 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 you come back almost to the day. I went over in September of 79, came back in September, I'm sorry, I went over in September of 77, came back in September of 79. Okay. And uh, you came back to where? I came back to Ellsworth Air Force Base, and that's another story. Wordsmith, Michigan is real cold, and I spent six years and nine months up there. Not only is it cold, but it's overcast from sometime in October until sometime in March. I'm from Denver, Colorado. 305 days of sunshine a year, all right? Mm -hmm. And here I am, <laughs> okay, yeah. with all of these clouds and this and the other, time, yeah. okay? Plus the cold. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so cold there that back in World War II, before our time, the Army practiced Arctic survival training there, 
or, or one of the militaries that I think was on there, but someone practiced Arctic survival training. Mm -hmm. That's just how cold it was. So when I, when I get notified by SAC that I'm going to Ellsworth Air Force Base, I get on the phone and I say, listen, Wordsmith is called a northern tier base. There are not very many people, it's very cold, it's dismal, and they told me that if you do two tours, because one tour is three years, I was there for six years, nine months, they told me if you do two tours, you don't have to go back. I said, I've done my two tours, why are you sending me to Ellsworth? They said, well, I think you'll find that Ellsworth is a far cry from Wordsmith, okay? I mm. think you're gonna like it. Well, sure enough, I get to Ellsworth and I find that the climate's a lot like Denver, Colorado. Where's Ellsworth at? Ellsworth is in Rapid City, South Dakota, okay. about 400 miles north of, D of Denver. Okay. okay. And sure enough, it's drier there. You got sunshine. You don't get nearly as much snow. No. Mm -hmm. The one thing that, and I say nearly as much snow because there at Wordsmith, we average 150 inches a year. You know, here in Cincinnati, when we get six or seven inches, they think they've got snow. <laughs> Not a big deal. But I get to Ellsworth. And all, and I find that this is pretty decent. The climate's not too bad, what have you. I think I'm going to like this after all, and I ended up liking it. I really did. No, uh, the only thing that that was a drawback was the fact that it was extremely windy. Okay, but other than that, it wasn't bad. And we bought a house while while we were in Rapid City, because <clears throat> I had watched people retire from the service who hadn't saved anything. Right. And I didn't want to be in a position of having to live somewhere that I didn't want to live because I hadn't saved anything. So I, I told my wife, I said, we're going to save like crazy, and that's what we had done. No, okay. So we bought a house there in Rapid City as kind of an investment and all. And because of that, we were in the foothills, where the winds would kind of go over this way and hit the base, but it wasn't bad for us at all. So it was very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I liked it. Now, um, can we take a break right now? I'm uh, Jim, I, um, I, uh, we, we uh, mentioned that your son Galen was born in 1970. Mm -hmm. You also have a daughter, uh, and what is her name? Her name is Nico, N-I-C-O. Okay. Uh, uh, I wanted to call her Nico Ruel, and my, my wife said nobody will ever pronounce it correctly, so she became Nico Rochelle. <laughs> okay. And when was she born? Four years after him. She was born in 1974. I see. Okay. Uh, and um, I think uh, that we last talked that you were uh, now at uh, Ellsworth, Rapid City, That's South correct. Dakota. That's correct. I came back to... Uh, and are you back on flying duty? I am back on flying duty. But because I've been out of the airplane for four years, mm -hmm. you know, I had to go back and retrain in the airplane again. You know, it's kind of a refresher training, so to speak. That's B-52. That's correct. Yeah, still back in the B-52s and all. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when I went out there to Castle uh, Air Force Base, I think if I recall, the refresher training was only about six weeks, maybe eight weeks, something like that. Initially, it had been about three and a half months. You know, it's not real fresh in my mind, but close enough. And one of the things that they're always concerned about is air refueling, because the thinking then was, if you ever went to war and the missions were going to go so long, we were absolutely going to have to air refuel somewhere. Right. So, I'm talking to an instructor, and I've made major by this time, and he's a captain, but he's the instructor, so he's in charge. You know? mm -hmm. And he's talking to me the day before, he says, well, sir, we're going to go up and fly tomorrow, so we're going to air refuel. I said, do you have an air refuel for a while? He said, uh, do you want to try it yourself, or do you want to kind of watch me? I said, well, let me try it, and if I, if I get a little dangerous or something like that, you just take the airplane and all. He said, okay, we can do that. So we get up there, <clears throat> we fly into the envelope, and we hook up to the other airplane. Now, when you hook up, there's a boom that comes down from the other airplane that fits in the orifice over your head, all right? And you're using certain sections that you see to line yourself up properly. Uh, when you do that, uh, you can fly in turns, right and left, that sort of thing. You normally won't go up and down because you have a box and you stay in that altitude box, okay? Like, for example, I'll say 26 to 28,000 feet, so maybe you stay right at 27. And then that allows you to go, allows the tanker to go up 1,000 feet in an emergency breakaway, allows you to go down an emergency breakaway. So that's what you're doing, and you make it turns. When you fly this airplane, most, most pilots 
prefer to fly it with the autopilot off. Now let me tell you what that means. You have an air refueling autopilot. And what that air refueling autopilot does is it, it makes the turns a little more gentle as far as, uh, in other words, it doesn't require as much mm. uh, strength to turn it. I didn't tell you this before, but let me see if I can give you an idea and then I think this will make sense to you. When I first got an airplane, we'd spend an hour in the traffic pattern. Now I'm a good sized guy, okay? This airplane requires so much force that the first two or three times I flew it, I'd come down with a sore shoulder, all right? They have what they call trim tabs, and that helps to trim off some of that pressure. By the fourth day, I'm learning how to use the trim tabs and all, and I'm not hurting as much, mm -hmm. all right? Years later, when I upgraded to the left seat, I went through the same thing with the left shoulder, but this time I learned after about one day instead of two or three days and all. But there's a lot of force there. Okay, a lot of force because it's an older airplane and it doesn't have the hydraulic assist systems that we have on modern planes today. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, uh, I, I get in this airplane and I know that with some people, they prefer to fly with the autopilot off because when you have the air refuel autopilot on, there's a tendency for it to fight you. If you get up to about 12 degrees, it wants to hold it at 12, doesn't want to go to the next one, and you have to fight to get through that, okay? When you're coming back, it wants to stay where it is. It, doesn't want to, it does not want to go back to straight and level as far as what you're doing with the yoke of the airplane. Mm -hmm. And most guys prefer to air refuel without a pilot off. Well, you'll recall I said back in training with the 52, there was one fellow who became a conscientious objector. Right. Usually you don't learn how to air refuel until you've been in the airplane for a year or two years or something like this. But Major Wampler, despite all his yelling and screaming, what had, was kind of a gift in a way, because he said, we only have two of you. I'm going to teach you young men how to air refuel this airplane. So when I came out of training with the 52, I already knew how to refuel it. Right. And we were refueling with the autopilot on most of the time. And I got to the point where I was comfortable with it on or with it off. It didn't make any difference, no. I mentally learned how to compensate for the differences in force. Well, when we got up here and we got to air refueling with this fella, and all, I've got the autopilot on, he'd make a turn, and I'd go with him, make a turn back, what have you. You only need 10 minutes to be qualified. And we were connected for about roughly 12 to 15 minutes, roughly in that neighborhood. When we finished up, we backed out, the air refueling is over, and now we're going to go to the rest of our mission, either a high-level nav leg or a low-level simulated bombing leg, one of the two. But when we got out, we pulled back, and we dropped a 1,000 feet, tanking went up a 1,000 feet, and the instructor looks at me and says, sir, that was disgustingly smooth, you know. <laughs> I felt very good about that, because I've been out of this airplane for four years, yes. and it had not left me, it was still there, you know. I felt yeah. good about it, Now <clears throat> I'll tell you about something else later on as we progress through this. But anyway, that went well. Uh, we finished up. The only thing, the, the big thing about being on an airplane four years and coming back is the co-pilot will read certain things and you respond. He reads, you respond, he reads, you respond. Well, when you've been out of for four years, you kind of forget what the response is. Could fire the airplane, fine, mm -hmm. but couldn't remember a lot of the responses and all. But anyway, <clears throat> we did that. It went well, uh, and I went back to my base and continue flying. Now, I'm going to fast forward uh, for about three years because I'm coming up on instructor school, all right? And <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about something that I remember that, that was not real pleasant for me. I was doing other things on the side, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm in the Air Force and I'm doing my job, I'm there on time, and this, that, and the other. But I'm thinking, the day is going to come when I'm going to be out of the Air Force and I want to be prepared. I want to be prepared as far as being able to send my kids to college. I want to be prepared as far as uh, being able to buy a house and that sort of thing. So I'm doing a couple of things on the side. I'm in a, a marketing program selling some things. And I found out later on that did not go over real well with the vice wing commander at the time. No, mm -hmm. the, uh, the DL, director of operations. No. And because of that, when slots came down, slots come down for instructor school, all right? When the slots came down, my name came up, and he denied my being able to take that slot. 
And my squadron commander called me and said, Jim, I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, you're as qualified as anybody going and more qualified than most. He said, but for some reason or another, the DO's got it in for you. Well, it happened the second time. Same thing happened now. And then they sent me up with uh, an instructor. He said, well, Jim, let's just kind of see how some things do go. You got eight engines on this plane. Usually, if you're going to simulate an engine being out, you pull it back to idle. This guy pulled the engine back to idle and shut it off. And then he pulled some circuit breakers, and when he pulled the circuit breakers, it allowed him to drop one of the gear with the other staying up. So I got an engine dead, I got a gear down, and then he took the autopilot off and said, now, go air refuel. And I went in and I refueled. We came out, we got back on the ground, he said, I did everything to you I could think of doing to you, and you did fine and all. He said, there's no reason you shouldn't be going to instructor school, okay? But I still didn't get it, <laughs> not at this time. I didn't get instructor school until I was restationed at Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana, okay? And I had uh, the squadron commander call me in again, said, no, you haven't upgraded to instructor yet. I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, are you interested in doing this? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, okay, we're going to send you out there. So he sent me out to instructor school again, back to Castle. Oh. What, year, what year is this, roughly? This, this has got to be, um, I'm going to say somewhere in the mid-80s. Uh, I don't have an exact date. I, I can nail it down. And, no, and no, I, that's fine. That um, about it. Did you ever ascertain why? Uh, you didn't get the uh, instructor's job while you were still up north there? Well, I think, <laughs> I'm not sure what I can say or what I can't say. You can say anything. I, I said that I was doing something marketing. Right. Inside. I was involved with Amway. Oh, okay. okay? Yeah. But, I, but I wasn't involving any, any of, of my people, subordinates, anything like that. I'm doing it on the side because like I said, I'm trying to make sure that I'm going to be able to buy a house, Send the kids to college, to send the other, okay? Right. This guy didn't like the fact, the DO did not like the fact that I was involved with that okay. one, okay? Because at one point, I had a conversation with him, and I was not one to hang around the squadron if I didn't need to be there. Right. If I need to be there, if I've got something to do, additional duties, I'll be there and I'll get that done. But if I don't need to be there, I won't be there and all that. I, I didn't believe in FaceTime, okay. okay, as a lot of guys did. Right. And he said to me, he said, yeah, some of our guys, you never know where they are if they're not in the squadron. They might be out selling Amway or something. And I didn't say anything. <laughs> somehow or another, he'd gotten the word on I that. I see. Okay? okay? Somehow or another, he'd gotten the word on that. It, it hurt me for another reason, too, and I'll, I'll get to that if I don't forget about it and all. <clears throat> but uh, because of that, I did not upgrade. Okay, All right. so I got picked for security police again, second time, all right? And this time I went to security police, I went to Barksdale Air Force Base. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. I went to Barksdale Air Force Base, still flying. And when I was there, the squadron commander called me in one day, said, you want to upgrade the IP? I said, yes sir, I do. He said, okay, we're going to send you out there, okay? And he didn't care about all the rest of the stuff or wasn't aware of it one of the two. Probably wouldn't have made any difference right. anyway. Okay. So anyway, he sent me out there and I'll <clears throat> out to Castle. And on the very first flight, uh, now I'm sitting in the right seat because that's where the instructor seat sits, what have you. And one of the things you have to do is demonstrate the limits. And you go azimuth-wise so far to the right, so far to the left, so far up, altitude-wise, so far down, and so far out and in. If you exceed any of the limits, the system will automatically switch you off. You know, it will drop you from, from air refueling. Or the guy up there who's watching you, because he's the one that's flying this boom down to you. That's mm -hmm. the boom operator and the right. airplane. If he sees something that scares him, he'll pop you off also. Okay. No problems. You know. And I did all the limits and did two or three other things and said another. When I got down, he said, good job, really good job. So you'll have no problems upgrading. Well, that evening, I went to a movie, and I saw one of the other instructors. And he said, you really watered Tom's eyes. I don't know if his name, his name was Tom or what.
but he was talking about the other instructors said he was really impressed with what you did there and all. And I kept thinking back to when the DO at that other base had said I wasn't qualified to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the one that had made the comment about Amway and what right. have you, okay. And uh, again, it kind of made me feel good. I went right back to, mentally I went right back to the young guy who said I'd wasted my time that I hadn't majored, majored in engineering. <laughs> okay, to me this was kind of the same thing happening again. I was kind of vindicated because somebody knew that I had the talents for it and all. Right. And I went on and upgraded there <clears throat> and all. Uh, I did have one other time, and I kind of forgot about this. I left, I left. Ellsworth Air Force Base, and I didn't go directly to Shreveport. I went to Air Command and Staff College. Okay. Uh -huh. And they say that about 15% of the force gets to go to Air, Air Command and, and Staff College. And I think part of it was because my record was decent. I'd never been in trouble at all. I had decent OERs and that sort of thing. And, and I had the kind of jobs too, because if you've worked as an operations officer doing other things, then it demonstrates that you can do something besides fly airplanes. So I went to Air Command and Staff College, and that worked out well. When I came out of Air Command and Staff College, guess what? They put me back to security police again, a second time. This time I went in as a squadron commander at Little Rock, Arkansas Air Force Base. Okay, um, And again, coming out of Air Command and Staff College, there are a lot of guys that are going to the Pentagon. Right. Uh, I was looking at the possibility of going to the Air Force Academy as a counselor. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I got a call one day, because uh, Air Command Staff College is 11 months. And I got a call one day, and this guy says, uh, I understand you've put in an application to come to Air Force Academy. I said, yes, I have. He said, well, let me ask you this. Are you African American? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, that would be good, because we need that, because we don't have as many image-wise that are African American. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. I just got notified that you're about to get a squadron at Little Rock, Arkansas Air Force Base. If you turn down that squadron, you know, you turn down the A prefix. If you don't get the A prefix now, you're never going to get it again. If you turn it down, you're never going to get it again. Okay? And what that means is that if you're, high, if you're shooting for higher rank, you're probably never going to get that either. He said, I'll tell you this. He said, being at the Air Force Academy sounds sexy in the second year, and it is. He said, but you're going to have more fun as a squadron commander. So I took the job in Little Rock, Arkansas as squadron commander. Mm -hmm. okay? And he's absolutely right. I really enjoyed it. It was fun. Because I got to call my own shots for a change. Okay? Yep. Uh, the only problem is sometimes when somebody had fallen down and broken his arm, you had to explain why he did that. <laughs> okay. But I enjoyed it. Really enjoyed <laughs> it. And um, so what year is this that you're at Little Rock and how long were you there? I was there from 84 and to 86, okay? And uh, then I went to Barksdale Air Force Base, Shreveport, Louisiana, and all. And that's when I became an instructor pilot. And went to? Castle Air Force Castle. Base to train, right. Okay, and then from Castle, where did you go after you? Uh, back to Shreveport, okay? Because okay. I was there, I'm, right now I'm at just about the end of my tour, as a matter of fact. Um, I got promoted. To Lieutenant Colonel. That's another thing. Let, let me back up. Now. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, when I was working as a as a chief of police, squadron commander in Little Rock, Arkansas, my wing commander called me in. Okay. And because uh, I was basically working for him as a squadron commander, you work for the wing commander unless mm -hmm. unless you're a base level, then you work for the base level. And he called me in. His name was General John, I mean, Colonel John Chambers. Neat guy, neat, neat guy. He's the kind of guy that you didn't want to let down because you did, you, you, I put it this way, you didn't want to do something to disappoint him and all. Mm. Uh, there, there are two different people you can work for. You can work for one guy who's kind of like Attila the Hun. You don't want to disappoint him because you're going to see your head go rolling down. Okay? Right. Then the other guy's a guy that, that gives you so much support that you just don't want to let him down. And that's why I felt about Colonel Chambers. Neat guy, neat guy. And he called me in, he said, Jim, the Lieutenant Colonel's list is out, you're not on that list. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, the Lieutenant Colonel's list is out, and you're not on that list. I said, I've he said, I've looked at your record and said, you should be on the list. There's no reason you shouldn't be on the list. Well, I think what had happened, 
the DO that I talked about, I think, had put remarks, or I'll put it this way. When you get an officer efficiency report, squadron commander signs it, then it goes to the DO, then it goes to the wing commander. Well, when we went to that DO, he was not as positive, he wasn't real negative, but at that time, if you said, this guy is a good soldier, or if you said, this guy is a very good soldier, the one that's gonna get promoted is where you said, very good soldier, right. okay? So he did something similar to that on my OER, because my, my present wing commander looked at that and said, he didn't use the words he should have used. He said, mm -hmm. we gotta fix this. We had some general to come in sometime after that, and I don't remember when, and he just told me, did you see that young officer over there? He needs to be a lieutenant colonel. I got promoted the next time, okay? And that makes all the difference in the world having the right person in your corner and all. Uh, if I may back up a minute, having the right person in your corner, if you, you, were, you were in the military, so you understand, if a guy makes master sergeant, I mean, so makes chief master sergeant in 24 years, he's done pretty good. Mm -hmm. If he makes it in, in what, uh, 18 years, he's done real good. Right. The first guy that I worked with in security police had made it in 14 years, okay? But he worked for a lot of generals. And if a general is signing your ticket, that means a whole lot more oh, than yeah. that captain signing your ticket. That's right. Okay? Not that he wasn't deserving, because he was bright. You know, mm -hmm. The guy had the vocabulary and everything else. First time he used the term passive acquiescence. I wasn't about to let him know I didn't know what it meant, but I wrote it down and went home and looked it up. <laughs> okay? Neat, neat guy and all. Chris, uh, his name was Bowden, neat guy. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, I got promoted then, and then uh, I went back to flying a second time, and then that's when I upgraded to instructor pilot uh, at Barksdale Air Force Base, near the career, end of my career, okay? Uh, so I went in as a lieutenant colonel to Barksdale Air Force Base, and I retired three years after that. Um, at Barksdale? At Barksdale. And um, you're a lieutenant colonel? Right. And um, what year is that? I retired in 1989, okay? And I pinned on Lieutenant Colonel Spars, I mean, the leap at, in 87, that would have been. Okay. So you me. finished 20 years and, and a few months and, uh, and retired. Uh, so what are you gonna do with your life now? Well, I had always wanted to fly for the airlines, okay? And, <clears throat> I thought that door had closed because when I was interested in flying, if you were beyond 32 or 33, the airlines would not hire you. Well, at some point they got to look around and said, you know what, you got these military guys with all this experience, they've done so much moving around, they're gonna be stationary and not wanna do a lot of moving, let's start hiring them. So I get a call from a friend of mine who was two years ahead of me, he was also a black lieutenant colonel who also flew B-52s, as a matter of fact. In fact, our kids kind of grew up together. His name is Walt Archie. And Walt calls me and says, hey, Jim, guess what I'm doing? I had always talked about flying for the airlines. He had never talked about flying for the airlines. He says, I'm flying for United Airlines. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> That's what he was doing, okay? And he said, you need to get your resume in. Well, here's kind of a sad part, but it's part of my life, so I'll just tell you the whole thing. I went on to put a resume in, okay, uh, for United, and I put resumes in at several other places also. And I ended up getting hired at United, okay. Uh, meanwhile, I also had put in a resume at Northwest, Northwest Airlines, mm -hmm. all right? And they called me in for an interview. And I was pretty sure I was going to get hired at, North, at, at United now. And the guy asked me a question. He says, well, listen, if you had an opportunity to go fly for any airline, which one would it be? Well, I said, Delta Airlines. He said, well, why Delta? I said, well, Delta doesn't believe in laying off. So there's a lot of security there. He said, okay, that makes sense. Now, I don't pride myself in being stupid. <laughs> but his next question was, well, if you couldn't fly for them, who would you fly for? I gave a name and it wasn't Northwest. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Mom had taught me to be honest, but she didn't teach me to be stupid. <laughs> At this time, I'm being a little stupid at all. Mm. And uh, I gave him this answer. And uh, toward the end of the career, I mean, the end of the uh, interview, he says, well, I certainly wish you a lot of luck in your airline career. And I knew I'd give her the wrong answer at that right. point. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't know that it mattered a whole lot. I got picked up with United, and I knew that was going to happen. And I got picked up in United. Now, let's back up a minute. What I didn't tell you during the initial interview is, night after night I was in the books, okay, when I was in pilot training, the first year of pilot training. Studying hard, studying on the weekends, that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why I did as well as I did for that period of time. Well, fast forward 20 years, I took that same approach with United. I'm studying every night, studying on weekends, this and the other. And I basically got burnt out. I reached the point where he had asked me a question. I couldn't remember what he said five minutes before, let alone the day before or two days before. Okay? And as a result of that, I ended up not finishing that program okay, with United. I ended up leaving, uh, which was really very painful because there had been times as a kid when I had driven my car out by the side of the runway and I'd watch airplanes take off and say, yep going to fly one of those one of these days, one have you know. And here I had this opportunity that was gone and gone forever, because once you turn down something like that, they're not going to call you back. There are too many other pilots looking, so it's not going to happen at all, okay. And just, just extremely, just painfully disappointed and all. And uh, I got home, and the very next day I started filling out resumes again, okay. Because I said, well, if it won't work there, maybe it will work someone else. I had two regional airlines that wanted me to come work for them. One was a Northwest regional airline, different from the people I talked to before, and one of course was Comair. I didn't tell you this, but I worked as a janitor when I was in college also. Mm -hmm. And I took pride in the floors looking good and this and the other. As a matter of fact, I got called in one day and the, my boss says to me, he says, Jim, I talked to you about these floors. I looked around, they're spick and span, it's shiny <laughs> and all. I said, I thought I was doing a good job. I said, you're doing too good. You got people slipping the phone. You got to back off. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So I backed off, all right? Well, when I went to Northwest, I'm looking around, and it's really not too clean. It doesn't look all that good. I get the Com Air, and everything's spick and span. That's why I decided to go to work for Com Air, because of how good it looked. I did something else. They had a program that was as rigorous as United's, but the difference is they cram even more into a shorter period of time. Because United was about two and a half months. This is about a month, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you can be older and you can learn from younger folk. There were four of us renting this apartment. You know, and one of the guys was 24 years of age, Greg Gardello. He said, let's do this. When we come in from studying and all, let's go get in the swimming pool. And he said, that will relax your mind. He was absolutely right. We get in the swimming pool for 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes, get out, and it's like starting off the new day, you know. Right. I ended up doing much better and all, and I ended up being uh, allowed to finish the program with Calm Air, and I flew for them for 14 years. For 14. Okay? 14 years. Now, unfortunately, this, at the end, That takes you all the way up to 2004, if my math. That's correct, that's correct. But that's go correct. ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 not, not a problem at all. Uh, in 2004, I had a situation where age was an issue. Uh, I kept hoping they were going to extend the retirement age. Right. Okay. And that wasn't happening. 60 was the cutoff. Right. No. And I ended up having to retire at, his, at, at uh, 60 in 2004, whether I wanted to or not. And I was fortunate, I got another job flying a corporate jet, and I flew there for about three years, okay. Did you retire, were you flying for Delta, uh, Com Air here in, uh, in Cincinnati? I was, I was, I was based in Cincinnati, you know, and that worked out real well. Uh, I ended up been, moving my wife here. As a matter of fact, when I first came here, the intent was to come to Cincinnati, get some more flying experience, and then move on to a major somewhere else, okay. And after about six months we'd been here, she said, you know what, she said, we did so much moving in the military. If we don't have to move anymore, I'd just soon not move. I said, good enough, you know. I, we, I've been saving since high school. So we were debt free, didn't know anybody, what have you. 
Um, and when I left the service, they were putting $1,100 a month in my check and savings for me, what have you. Know. So we were in good shape. I didn't have to go somewhere else. I said, if you want to stay here, we'll stay here. And that's what we elected to do. You know. I was in a position where I could do that. I knew guys that had been over 20 years and hadn't saved a nickel. Okay? Yeah. And I was too security oriented for that. See, one of the things I've not talked about is when I was, I said I got married at 17, divorced at 19. What I didn't talk about is the fact that I had a couple of people call me saying, you owe us money. And I said, never again will I be in a position where someone can call me because I owe my dollar bill. Well, Ruth kept you straight too. Uh, well, I'll put it this way, she didn't fight me. Because the first two years and all, we'd get something paid off. And she's, because the first two years we had about $2,500 worth of bills and all. She'd say, well, we got this paid off, now I can go buy it. No, 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 you can't buy that yet. So we got to get everything paid off, okay? So it caused a little tension. But after two years, we were debt free. Mm -hmm. And I told her, now here's what we're going to do. We're never again going to make another bill except for cars and houses. Kind of hard to pay cash for cars and houses. Everything else we're going to pay cash for or we don't get. Simple as that. Okay. And that's what we did. No. Um, <laughs> now, did Ruth ever work? She's a teacher. Oh, you okay. see. Yeah. yeah, she's a teacher. So she, she, uh, she did a lot of substitute teaching when we were living in different areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. When we moved to Cincinnati, this was the first time where she could career-wise teach full time. Did Ruth graduate from Bishop also? She did. She okay. graduated from Bishop and she earned a uh, uh, master's degree from Black Hills, South Dakota State, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. uh, while we were in Rapid City, South Dakota. Okay. And uh, everywhere we went, they'd say, well, you can substitute, but you got to take these hours. You can substitute, but you got to take these hours. And we sat down and added it up one day. And we said, if she could get credit for all the hours she had to take just to substitute, she'd be within about three to six hours of a doctorate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So she did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, did she teach here in Cincinnati? She did. And where did she teach at? Ooh, she, she taught at McKinley, which I think is the oldest high school in the city, I believe. Oh, yes. She taught at Crest Hill mm -hmm. uh, prior to that. And she retired, uh, I'm going to say, six, seven years ago. And when she retired, the principal that had been at Crest Kill had gone to the Board of Education and started working there. And she called her one day and says, Ruth, I need a teacher. And Ruth is retired now. And, and her, her degree, by the way, her master's was in um, guidance and counseling. Mm -hmm. And she says, Ruth says, um, I need a teacher. And Ruth says, what do you need a teacher for? She says, well, we're trying to bridge the gap for kids that are in school, that are in some kind of a medical facility because of some, some kind of illness or whatever. Uh, out here at Children's Hospital, there's sometimes kids are there for a month, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes more. And we're trying to bridge that gap. And said, I need someone to build a curriculum for that. My wife's response was, well, I'll think about it and I'll pray about it. The lady came back immediately. She said, I've already prayed about it. Your name came up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ruth said, well, I guess I, guess I have to take it then. <laughs> okay. So she started working with them, started building a curriculum, and she only had about 17, 18 kids, and she really enjoyed it because just a few kids, she could really work with them. Right. And she worked with them that first year, built a program for them and all. Okay. Uh, the very next September, <clears throat> when they started her out, she ended up with close to 100 kids. So at the end of, um, at the end of that year, she retired one more time. Okay. And she got a call again, Ruth, I need a teacher. <laughs> what do you need to teach for this time? Well, we've got a lady that took your place. She's getting ready to have knee surgery. Why don't you come in just for a couple of months while she recovers from that? We said, okay, I'll do that. When she got back, she found out they had hired three people to take her place. Yeah. So she was a pretty good worker, pretty oh. good worker and all. So, but that's what she's done, and now she's, she's no longer doing anything. Um. Jim, we've uh, covered uh, from
from your life all the way up to almost the present here. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to this interview? It's been uh, very enlightening and... Uh, Something that you might find a little humorous. I'll talk a little bit about my daughter, Nico. Mm -hmm. My mother corrected my English from the time I was like so. I'd come in and I'd say something like, well, you know, I would have went, you would have what? Have, has, and had, you would have gone. And I said, okay, I would have gone. Or I might say, well, I would have saw, you would have what? Have, has, and had, you would have seen. You know, and I absolutely resented it now. But it made such an impression on me that I listened to the way other people expressed themselves and all. And I tried not to make those simple mistakes. Yeah. I mean, we all make mistakes, myself included. But I tried not to make the simple ones and all. Well, when my kids came along, I did the same thing with them. I started correcting the English. Now, with my son, he really didn't mind so much. My daughter absolutely resented it, as I had, okay? I came in one day from a three-day trip, and she was going to University of Northern, uh, uh, Northern Kentucky University out here. Okay? Mm -hmm. And she had helped Ruth to write one of these Christmas letters. And this Christmas letter, she says, Mom is doing so-and-so. I think that's when she was working at Crest Hill. Brother Galen's doing so-and-so. Dad is doing so-and-so. Nico has decided to major in English. All the dad's correcting over the years has finally paid off. <laughs> so she's been an English teacher out in Lakota West for a number of years. Oh, is that right? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. And uh, this fall, uh, she will transfer from there to uh, St. X. You know. I see. And, uh, and I still sometimes, thanks to mom, I have to bite my tongue to keep from correcting her. <laughs> and your son just graduated from Purdue? No, my grandson. Oh, your grandson. Yeah. I'm sorry. My son. Forgive me. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I kind of left that out. Some years ago, my son had an opportunity to go to Purdue or Howard University in Washington, D.C. Howard University is a predominantly black school. And I said to him, I said, you know, if you go to Howard University, I said, anyone who's black knows where the school is. I said, a lot of educated whites know where the school is mm -hmm. also because it's in Washington, D.C. I said, but if you go to Purdue, that guy who dropped out of school in the third grade knows where it is and all, and it can mean a difference on your resume. But he decided that he wanted to go to Howard because I told you about Walt Archer a while ago. Mm -hmm. Walt Archer had some kids that my kids have been stationed with twice while we were in the Air Force, and one was there and he kept saying, come on in, the water's fine, okay? So he went to Howard University and he graduated from Howard, okay? My grandson comes along here about four years ago, five years ago, and he's thinking about Purdue. He says, you know, 23 of the astronauts went to Purdue, which I didn't know, but that's, that's what he came up with. And also, the, I think they were ranked number four in terms of the number of businesses that come to Purdue looking for kids to employ. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, that's a good thing. And then a huge number of them graduated and already have a job. So he went to Purdue, uh, finished up four years on time, and uh, his last semester, which was this past semester, he had four job interviews and three job offers. Wow. Uh, one of those job offers, uh, he was not impressed with the professionalism of the folk. Is in another state, I won't say where it is, I don't want to get sued, <laughs> okay. So he decided he didn't want to work there. Summer before last, he worked as an intern here in the city, $2,600 a month for a student in school. And then last summer, he had worked for General Motors, $4,100 a month as an intern. Well, they had called him and said, we'll put you to work for us and all, and we'll start you off. And I think they're starting him off at 7,000 a year or something like that, which is not bad for a kid that's broke in college. Well, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, another company contacted him and said, we'll start you off at 60, we'll give you a $3,000 sign-up bonus, what have you. He said, I think I'll take that one. Okay. So he will go to work uh, seriously in about six weeks. You know, they've given him some time off and all. For whom? Uh, Cap Gemini. Okay. Or Cap Gemini, I think it's called. Okay. Uh, I'm not real familiar with it. It's in the Chicago area, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing yeah. and all. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's where he'll go to work. And he said this, he said, in his career field, approximately, uh, 
approximately 95, well, here's what he said, in his career field, there's almost 100% of the kids who come out of Purdue and already have a job. Yeah. As the whole, if you look at the whole graduation class, about 95% of them come out and already have a job. And this was part of what he was looking like yeah. before. Uh, he's a thin kid, he's about 122 pounds, all, okay? He wrestled in college, I mean in high school, at the 116 level, 119 level, that sort of, that sort of thing, you know, real, real thin individual. But his last year of high school, he didn't wrestle because he said, if I don't wrestle, I can, I can dedicate more time to my studies and get ready for Purdue. Right. And his last semester, uh, he, call, he calls me Papa, he calls me and says, hey Papa, guess what I got on my calculus final? And so, oh, probably about 93, 94, he said, I got 100%. Okay. <laughs> you know, very proud of himself. And of course, we are too. You are too. But yeah. with all of this in mind, he decided to go there. And he ended up uh, majoring in industrial management. So yeah. that's what he's going to do. Well, um, I want to tell you, I appreciate the, uh, this interview with you. And I am just fascinated about your life. and. Uh, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming down, and it's a real pleasure to know you and be your friend, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that.